So let's uh, start. So first of all, a little bit of uh, background. So what is uh, the driving force uh, behind all our activities in whatever area in the Commission today? Is uh, the EU 2020 initiative proposed uh, by President Barroso when uh, uh, he started uh, forming uh, the new uh, College of Commissioners who, uh, which uh, took office uh, on the 9th of February 2011 and 10, excuse me. What happened is uh, that uh, based on the guidelines uh, he presented uh, in front of the European Parliament in order to get the endorsement after having been appointed uh, by member states as uh, the candidate uh, to uh, the presidents of uh, the College of the Commission, uh, immediately after taking office on the 3rd of March 2010, we uh, launched the EU 2020 initiative, an in initiative for smart, inclusive, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, intelligent uh, uh, job, job and, and growth. And this is uh, very important because uh, there we have defined uh, uh, seven flagship initiatives. And one of them is uh, very relevant for uh, issues related to interoperability, standards, <coughs> and e-government. So I'm going to concentrate in the first place on the digital agenda that is uh, the framework in which uh, we develop all our activities uh, related to e-governments, uh, e-government and interoperability. So. What is uh, the digital agenda about? First of all, we have uh, started uh, from the, the constatation that we have a number of barriers uh, to the development of uh, the dig digital society in Europe, La uh, such as lack of uh, enough infrastructure, lack of security, lack of interoperability, fragmented digital markets, not enough uh, research and development, and uh, we are not uh, uh, responding well to uh, societal changes. And uh, we don't have all the necessary skills, both on the uh, citizens and on the uh, <coughs> professionals. So if we want uh, to convert uh, this vicious circle into a virtuous circle, we need uh, to deploy infrastructure, create content, and increase uh, the service demand. And all that uh, will be feeding back so that uh, we progress in the future if we really want uh, Europe, Europe to be really, really digital. And uh, in order to tackle the seven barriers that we have identified, we have uh, created uh, seven, time, uh, seven types of actions. The first one is uh, we need an European single market. It, very much in line with the internal market. I, I really liked uh, what the, the, the minister in charge of, of, of uh, e-government said uh, from Estonia, that uh, the important thing is not e-government, the important thing is the internal market. And the contribution of e-government to the internal market is uh, significant. The second thing is interoperability and standards. We need to develop interoperability. We need uh, to create cross-border interoperability, and for that we need standards, relevant standards. And contrary to what uh, everybody believes, uh, we don't need very many technical standards. We need uh, more organizational standards uh, and legal standards. Third is uh, related to trust and security. No trust, no access to content, no access to, uh, to electronic services, no growth in, in the economy. Then we need infrastructure. We need a very fast internet if we want to, to compete globally. Then we need research and innovation. Innovation is the future if we want to fight uh, for our life uh, as a, at the European level in the world. Of course, we need, uh, as I said, enhancing e skills from uh, to, uh, to citizens and to professionals. And finally, we have a number of challenges uh, that uh, we can um, uh, meet with uh, a more, e bet more and better use uh, uh, or, uh, with, uh, of uh, ICT, more particularly in, in areas uh, such as e-government or e-health. Commissioner Cruz, who is uh, managing the whole digital agenda process, uh, expressed that in a single phrase. <laughs> the press guy said, but uh, this is not possible. This is a phrase that doesn't have any verb. Still, I believe that uh, this uh, phrase, is, uh, this sentence is extremely meaningful. Every European digital, and this is quite challenging. So, one year after starting the digital agenda for Europe, which was presented in May 2010 under the Spanish presidency, we have progressed a lot. In some areas, not enough. In, in others, we have gone faster. So. This is uh, the reality. The reality is that 
There are areas in red where we need progress, and we may fail to meet uh, the deadlines. So, so we, we need uh, to really work uh, hard uh, there. But there are others where we are doing very well. Interoperability and standard is uh, pillar number two. It's important, it's meaningful. We need an additional effort. And uh, I'm going to tell you what we are doing in order to cope with uh, this uh, challenge. So what is uh, the strategy and framework for e-government activities in general? First of all, the first reference is uh, the ministerial declaration uh, in Malmo in 2009. And the second is uh, the large-scale uh, projects uh, that are funded uh, by the Competitiveness and Innovation Program and uh, the ISA, the program that my director, director general is uh, running since uh, uh, 2007 and that was approved in 2009 by the European Parliament and the European uh, uh, Council after first reading uh, showing a lot of support uh, for our initiatives. And this is uh, fully devoted to interoperability. This is uh, the core, very much in line with uh, the subject of uh, the, the, um, the, this uh, tutorial today. What did the minister say? said? Endorsed also by the industry and the civil society. That uh, we have four issues to tackle with e-government. Efficient and effectiveness of our government, empowering users, promoting the internal <coughs> market, contributing <coughs> to the internal market, and then developing the enablers and preconditions that are going to lead us to be able to, uh, uh, to, to meet the challenges in this area. We need a new generation of open, flexible, and seamless e-government services. Interoperability. There are plenty of interactions. There are interactions cross-border interactions. There are interactions between public administration, most of them. As a matter of fact, uh, there are plenty of, uh, of uh, things that are going on bilateral, multilateral. There are less that are going on at a cross-border European level. There are much less interactions, today, real interaction between the citizens and business and administrations of other countries. This is uh, the real challenge. How we de uh, develop and deploy those services so that somebody in Estonia could open a business in Spain with no problem, exactly at the same level uh, as a Spanish citizen can do in the country. There are also interactions uh, with the, the, uh, the uh, European Union administrations. But I have to clarify something. Citizens and business normally do not address us only in very specific areas where they have uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, apply <coughs> for grants. That might be in the area of uh, citizenship, that might be in the new European Citizen <coughs> Initiative, that might be when they are applying for grants uh, as a person of a, of a university into the framework programs uh, for uh, research and innovation. But uh, we don't have citizens as a customers a set for information and is there we concentrate all our efforts our interaction with citizens and businesses in application of the subsidiarity principle is uh, being carried out through european public administrations and i believe that's very good <coughs> so interoperability we tend to think that uh, we are going to solve all the problems at technical level no no, there are much more barriers at legal level, at operational level or organizational level. Semantic, don't forget one thing. There are 23 official languages in the European Union. And every citizen has the right, recognized by the treaties, to be addressed in their own language. And this is something we respect. When any citizen writes to the Commission, may write in his own tongue. And we have the obligation to translate that, to prepare the reply, and then to translate the reply back so that the citizen gets the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the reply into uh, their own language. It's a right. So we cannot dismiss that. And of course, uh, technical. But uh, you know, the internet has been so wonderful for the last years that I believe that never, at least in my experience in the Commission, never we had to, st uh, to stop any kind of a deployment, deployment of an information system because of lack of technical standards. Never. Never heard that. So we need really to concentrate on legal and operational and semantic. And we are, we are doing 
pretty well on semantic, still on operational and legal, there are plenty of things uh, to do. So, together with member states, uh, during uh, 2009 and part of 2010, we were developing an European interoperability strategy that is at the heart of the ISA program. ISA stands for Interoperability Solution for European Public Administrations. And uh, those are the priorities that we are defined by our colleagues in member states uh, as uh, the focus for the program. First of all, we need to exchange information, but we need to exchange information in a trusted way. It's absolutely essential. Second, we need to create an interoperability architecture that is driving the way we are going to shape and to, to develop and deploy our services. And then, now every regulation, every directive is supported by an information system, by a website. It's at that moment, and based on the experience, on the bad experience, I would say, that we had in uh, uh, implementing the service uh, directive, that uh, we need to intervene so that uh, everything is right at the legislation process so that we can know very clearly what has to be done in order to support the objectives of the legislation. And we are now running a number of pilots uh, with some of the uh, legal initiatives uh, in, the, in the Commission so that we make sure that uh, the IT issues are tackled properly. Uh, excuse me. And in addition to that, in order to help ourselves, <coughs> in order to help uh, the, the people in member states uh, that are busy with interoperability, in order to comply with one of the recommendations we receive uh, on the evaluation of uh, the, the predecessor of, uh, of uh, ISA called IWC, we need uh, to create awareness. And we need to create awareness because uh, interoperability in the empty space is uh, very theoretical. So we need to refer to very practical cases where interoperability has enabled the deployment of a service with clear benefits or to enhance and highlight that lack of interoperability is preventing some services for, from being deployed. And we are losing a lot of money and credibility with the, with the citizen. They don't have to do the integration. We need to put them at the center. We need to integrate everything. We need to make everything interoperate at the European level if we really want the development of the single market and cross-border services. So, this is a strategy, and then we created the framework. This is uh, the second version of uh, the European Interoperability Framework. Very famous document, very much used as an inspiration by member states and uh, other countries around the world. We apply the subsidiarity and proportionality. I mean, things will be done there where it's more, more effective. And the lowest, the better. Second is we need to meet uh, user needs and expectations. And this is common for every system, be it national or European. And then we need to, to be based on collaboration. And collaboration requires openness, re uh, uh, requires uh, technology uh, neutrality, and uh, requires uh, effectiveness and efficiency. And of course, the more the more we are going to reuse, the more we are going to the more we are going to learn from each other, the better will be for interoperability. When you reuse, de facto you are interoperating. One of the novelties uh, into the European Interoperability Framework version two is this conceptual model. This is not an architectural model. Nothing to do with implementation. It's just uh, defining the layers of a typical public service, and I do not speak about uh, EU <laughs> electronic public services. This is a normal service. And it's very clear, if we do not solve the two levels at the bottom, we are not going to progress in government. And the minister uh, in charge of, of uh, e-government here said that very clearly. The access uh, to the registries is vital, but the barriers are enormous. We are now running a study where we are identifying, we have asked member states to identify one specific register in order to analyze the barriers of accessing those uh, data internally at national level and at uh, European level. <coughs> and it's amazing. It's amazing even within the countries, between the regions and the central government. I can tell you that there are already plenty of uh, barriers at national level. If we don't, do not solve them, we can forget about uh, cross-border services. 
We have very clear targets uh, into the digital agenda for this specific uh, uh, um, uh, topic of interoperability and standards. First of all, the first one, completed. The Belgian presidency organized an e-government conference in, uh, very well organized, uh, by the way, Frank, uh, in, uh, in, in Belgium in December 2010. And there, on the 16th of December, we presented the new uh, version of uh, the European Interoperability Framework and uh, the European Interoperability Strategy, together with a communication from the Commission to the Parliament and the Council on the role of interoperability for cross-border services in Europe. Then uh, we are now working on uh, uh, standards for e-procurement. I will speak about that a little bit later. And then by 2013, we have agreed with member states uh, that they will be implementing the ideas of uh, the EIF, European Interoperability Framework and a Strategy, and uh, the conclusions of Malmo, e-government conference, and Granada, under uh, the Spanish uh, presidency, into their own frameworks. And this is uh, a very important challenge uh, for them. But, uh, Pretty well done in member states for the time being because there are some of them that are very, very much advanced. Second is we are working on what we call the European Interoperability Architecture. Today, plenty of services, mostly between public administrations, are dealing with interoperability ad hoc. There are very little things that is defined as necessary at the European level. Building blocks that are being reused or even uh, some kind of reference agreement on which you can inspire your interoperability. What we expect to do is to identify more and more of those mandatory building blocks in order to favor cross-border interoperability and to create more and more reference interoperability agreement that are going to inspire the future European public services, the cross-border services. So we expect that in the future we have the catalogs that are going to uh, allow member states to pick and choose, and uh, develop according to those agreements. And that's going to greatly favor interoperability. Some examples. First of all, at uh, the physical layer you want. ISA is funding a uh, now famous <laughs> uh, uh, IP network called Estesta. Estesta is uh, today joining together about 100 public administrations, be it national or European. And they can use it for cross-border e-government services between administrations, or they can also use it in order to develop more bilateral or multilateral services. It's increasing a lot the, the, the traffic, it's uh, encrypted into the backbone, and we are ready to certify, to classify the information whenever we find an application that will need it. We have all the procedures in place to, to proceed. Very interesting uh, approach today, in nowadays, uh, where there are plenty of uh, dangers out there into the internet. Second, excuse me, large scale pilot. You are going to hear a little bit today about uh, one, I will mention that uh, briefly, but uh, the two colleagues uh, that are here from Austria and uh, Belgium, they have been the engines behind this, uh, this, uh, this uh, large scale uh, project that is funded half by the competitiveness and innovation program from the European Commission and by the member states are participants. And they are, now go, they are now going to the second version of Stork, what proves uh, the success of the, the first phase. We have others. People devoted, uh, the stork is uh, devoted to EIDs. People is uh, devoted to e-procurement. Codex is uh, the change of, uh, of uh, judiciary information. Spox uh, deals with uh, the service directive and uh, the single point of contact in order to open business from one citizen or one business in a country to set up a business in another country. And EPSOS is uh, uh, related uh, to the change of uh, information related to patients. So. Your patient history can be a change between countries. This is a quite an accomplishment in a, a Europe that has to respect the, fraud, the four freedoms. Freedom of circulation of citizens, businesses, services, and capital. Extremely important. So I'm going to deal with uh, people in the first place. So there are plenty of beneficiaries of, of people. First of all, small and medium enterprises that want to bid for business in another country or in the same country by electronic means. 
every country today has uh, some kind of fee procurement system. I would say even many e procurement system. The challenge is how we are going to interconnect uh, all those uh, e procurement systems in such a way that uh, with uh, my identity in the future, with uh, my specifications, I can bid for business somewhere else. Um, governments, despite the crisis, are still one of the major uh, um, purchasers of goods and services in Europe. So it's extremely important. Of course, you had to join together the, contractual, the contracting authorities, you had to, to, to bring together the industry, the standardization bodies, multidimensional problem, but attacking it very well. We ourselves, funded that by the ISA program, wanted to prove that because we are kind of a mini Europe, most of our call for tenders uh, are launched at European level and the bids are coming for consortia formed by companies around Europe. Today is a nightmare to sign a contract. Contract has to go on paper from one country to the other. So from Belgium to Greece, from Greece uh, to the UK, and from the UK to Italy. So we need to solve that. The same thing with the invoices. <laughs> the consortia has to sign. Well, we need to solve uh, this, uh, the, this issue. It's too long. We are, we are the, the process in time and the process in cost on a per transaction basis is too high. So what we did is, we are going to prove that we can set up an infrastructure that allows us to do e-procurement with our partners and at the same time connects to the people infrastructure, that is uh, the interoperability infrastructure to connect e-government platforms together with the industry. And we have proved that it's absolutely possible to receive electronic invoices from a company in one country through the PayPal infrastructure to our back office systems. And we are going further than that. Based on, on the e prior, this is our implementation of on the e procurement uh, practices, communication layer, we are going to be able to generalize that so that uh, we build what we call some kind of a trusted exchange electronic platform. And it's exactly the same. Uh, um, kind of technology and exactly the same kind of principles. And this is an example at the same time of reusability. This is at the heart of the ISA program. Let's go for EID. That is uh, the second topic, uh, or more particularly <laughs> the, the focus of uh, this uh, session. There are two specific uh, uh, actions uh, in the digital agenda that uh, uh, concern EID. One, is uh, the revision of the di directive. The directive has been there, and you will see with the data I'm going to display later, that uh, despite, the fact, despite the fact that the directive was pretty clear, we have managed to make a different implementation in different countries, and the situation is uh, very di diversified. The second is, uh, we know that we are not going to have a single identification in Europe. What we need to do is uh, try to make those electronic identification around Europe work together. So mutual recognition is the word, and trusted mutual recognition, and we need to work on that. And this is 2011 and 2012. I can guarantee you that uh, Commissioner Cruz is behind that full strength. In 2009, still uh, under the IWC program, we ran a survey with a external company with member states. And this is, uh, that this is the, the picture we found at the time. Has evolved a little bit, but not very much. Uh, I was informed yesterday by somebody working for the IPTS, uh, one of the uh, e, um, European Commission Institutes in, in Sevilla, that uh, through Eurobarometer, that is our survey kind of uh, approach uh, for the European uh, um, kind of uh, topics, that uh, they have just completed uh, a new study and uh, they have promised that they are going to give me a copy in order to update uh, my figures. But as you see, how are we going to solve the issues of, uh, of uh, electronic identity in Europe? There are already five countries that uh, do not have uh, ID. So we need to find means to have some kind of electronic ID. And uh, there are still 12 uh, on paper 
and there are 13 deploying, some of them very fast. I mean, the, the, the path at uh, which Estonia, Spain, uh, Belgium, uh, and others uh, deployed, uh, the, uh, are deploying the electronic identities, uh, the EID cards, uh, is, uh, is amazing. So technology is there, it's a matter of supporting and, uh, and, uh, and uh, putting the right uh, framework in place. And then uh, for biometrics, uh, that would be the next step, uh, the next step uh, so there are no plans, there were no plans in 21 countries. So, on the identification, not too bad. 27 member states out of 27 were using PKA system. And others were still using, in addition to that, uh, username and password with a single factor, multi factor, calculators, and, uh, and uh, mobiles. And I believe, I really believe that uh, the last one uh, is, uh, is uh, the future because everybody is going to own a mobile phone in the future. So a mobile device of any kind. And I believe that uh, we should uh, perhaps uh, invest uh, there. I, I am advising uh, Moldova on their e-government strategy and uh, they don't have an electronic identity card. But nevertheless, uh, they want to deploy they want to deploy uh, um, uh, e-government services. So they are now looking, being advised uh, by Estonia and uh, uh, Austria that are pretty advanced uh, in this area to deploy uh, mobile-based uh, um, authentic authentication. And this is uh, the way they are going. They have just uh, launched the, the call for tender. Jury is uh, there and he knows very much about that if anybody wanted to, to know. But uh, they are going pretty fast and they can give you a very good uh, um, advice on, on how to progress uh, quickly in the government with a full, full uh, top management support. I know that. Okay, so some of the challenges uh, we need to meet is uh, <laughs> There is a uh, national ID numbers that right? they are not uh, coordinated. They are not uh, structured in the same way. So how we are going to solve this problem? And then uh, how we are going to set up uh, some kind of assurance policy uh, for, for, for uh, cross-border in the European Union? Those are the challenges uh, we need uh, to, 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 to tackle now. So, Stork. You are going to hear a little bit about Stork uh, with the colleagues uh, from uh, Austria and, uh, and, uh, and Belgium. But uh, pretty much uh, supported uh, by a number of uh, member states. And it's about uh, setting uh, the, uh, the, uh, the framework for interoperability of uh, EID. And uh, the good news is that uh, we read uh, together this morning on uh, our we website uh, that uh, Stork is going to receive, is one of the winners uh, of uh, the EPSA 2011 Best Practice Certificate. So congratulations, guys. Uh, well done. So at the basis is uh, we know that citizens can interact with government with uh, the electronic identities at national level. The challenge is how to do that at European level. And this is uh, why Stork is there. And this, uh, those uh, guys uh, with uh, their own support, I mean funding support plus uh, the European Commission uh, SIP uh, support uh, have been progressing very well and they are about to deploy, to deploy the STORC 2.0. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, will give uh, some uh, uh, kind of uh, hints uh, in, in their presentations. So, I wanted to refer again as uh, I, I uh, presented uh, E prior as our contribution to uh, the pilot on e procurement, our contribution to the Stork project funded by the ISA program is uh, what we call the ECAS Stork integration. What uh, does uh, ECAS stand for? ECAS is our central service for authentication for all web applications and it stands for European Commission Authentication Service. It's a service to which Every web application will connect in order to authenticate the users. It's going, it's a base on an open source uh, tool called uh, uh, CAS and an open source uh, and an, an open protocol called uh, CAS as, uh, as well. And, uh, and uh, basically what uh, it does is uh, that creates a cookie into your uh, browser and uh, has a timestamp and a, a, a live stamp uh, as well. And based on that, uh, you can authenticate to, do, to, the, to, the, uh, to all our web applications. So, what we intend to do is, in the first place, is um, ECAS allows all our internal users and more and more external users to connect uh, to uh, a number of applications that are where we are deploying, both for internal use and also for the use of other public administrations. 
and our objective in the future is that any kind of user, be it business, citizen, or employee, could connect to our back office system using their national identity card. This is the challenge. And as usual, technology is not a problem. As a matter of fact, we started in uh, 2010 trying to see whether ECAS would accept other security providers. And we did it uh, with something called Cibulet. And then, very quickly, we said, why don't we try with uh, the Belgian and uh, uh, Austrian ID cards? Because uh, they were the engines behind, behind Stork. It looked so promising. So we said, ah, it looks, uh, it works. It's uh, not only, uh, and, uh, now, not only we are going to do that internally, we are going to connect uh, to the Stork infrastructure, and we are going to accept calls or identification through the uh, Stork uh, uh, um, uh, infrastructure to our back office systems. Then in August, we said, well, I believe that uh, we can do more, uh, uh, more, more, more countries. And this is uh, what we did. And in November, we had uh, some kind of a uh, big event. We put in place a new enhanced ECAN infrastructure, and we gave access with the identity card to one of our uh, kind of collaboration system called CircaBC. That is uh, some kind of uh, open source uh, tool that uh, we have developed uh, uh, for us and that uh, we give away through the OSOR, um, Open Source Observatory and Repository system that uh, we share with a uh, member state and federates uh, other forges uh, from, uh, from uh, member states uh, on open source uh, uh, software. And then in 2011, we are now enabling a number of external systems such as uh, the internal market information system or uh, the registry for uh, the, the carbon uh, footprints uh, called ETS through ECAS. Participants in those systems are going to apply for an ECAS ID and we are now demonstrating that if they have the identity card and we could validate the certificates against a pl validation platform at national level, they could access our systems. And this is the way we work always, is uh, we prove that that is technically possible. Now the barriers are organizational, semantic, and legal. Those large-scale uh, pilots I mentioned before, feedback each other, share a lot of technology and a lot of ideas. Our, our, our objective is that we don't develop things on a silo base. We reuse components of the different large-scale projects so that we create synergies. At the end of the day, this is a big, big, big change management process. And what is clear is that if you always do what you always did, you only will get what you always got. So we need to change. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. Oh. I'm not on. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Uh, who is the next speaker? I think it makes sense to go straight to Stork. Yes? Excellent. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to sit over here so I can make faces at the speaker when they reach 10 or 12 minutes. <coughs> I'll put you off. I to only get got eight minutes now. Ah, excellent. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, um, what Paco presented was... Uh, the European strategy and implementation. What I would like to show <laughs> is uh, what a member state does with uh, interoperability and EID. I have a lot of slides, but uh, I'll try to go through them uh, in as soft as possible way. What I want to show you is uh, to show how we try to build a society where e-government is uh, in the best possible uh, environment so that the citizen can function uh, as good as possible, as well in a physical as in a virtual way. So, uh, uh, if you want to do that, well then uh, the first thing you need to do is uh, to think about uh, who are the players. Uh, you have on one side public sector, on the other side you have your citizens. So, it uh, takes two to tango. So, the first thing you need to do is uh, try to analyze, well, who is this citizen? What does he want when it comes down to e-government? What kind of services does he want? How does he want to access these services? Uh, in which environment, with which tool, 
uh, etc. Uh, and we'll, we, we then later on look at the same and ask the same questions for the public sector. But um, I think you can uh, bring the answer to this question uh, back to four major um, objectives. First of all, you need to identify the person or the citizen in, in his different facets. In his private life, he has a certain role to play, but in his professional life, he has another certain role to play. And we need to take care uh, of, of both sides of that. I think, first of all, what he, what he is trying to, to achieve is to, when he interacts with <coughs> government, it has to be in the most efficient way. And understand by that, his definition of efficiency, yeah, that can be different from uh, citizen to citizen. Secondly, he wanted everything he does with government goes as fast as possible. Um, so speed there is important. Uh, in the session earlier this morning, uh, I think Slovenia said the best government is go no government, meaning by that it's a government that has automated the services in such a way that it is transparent, that it works by itself, and so on. So speed is important. Thirdly, I think everybody wants that uh, whatever is done is done in a full transparent way. And sorry, I could not find any other slide that <laughs> <laughs> presents it as, as clearly as that. Uh, but let's concentrate on the word of transparency and not so much on the picture. Uh, I think you all agree that uh, uh, government needs to be very open to what uh, they do with uh, your data, your private data, and that they show that they don't misuse uh, it when, whenever they use it. And then finally, uh, there is an element of cost. Of course, cost efficiency. Uh, nobody wants to pay too much, but they want to get out of it as much as possible. So these are the four main goals that uh, I think a citizen is looking for. Now, if you look at uh, the other side, what does government want? What do we as civil servants want to achieve? Well, I think the answer to that question is probably the same as what the citizen wants. We also want to be efficient. We want to be uh, as cost-effective and spend as least money uh, as possible. I think we all want to be transparent, and the tendency at least is uh, to be more and more transparent. Uh, and uh, uh, what was it? Efficient, speed, transparent, and cost. I think the, these goals, we all uh, want to achieve them also. Now, uh, now that we know what we want, we, I think you also need to look a bit deeper into what uh, what kind of citizen do we have in front of us? You cannot say, I have a citizen in front of me. You have a young generation who is coming there, who is using a number of tools, uh, who are maybe not the tools that we use. They use mobile phones. Uh, they write SMSs at the speed of light, and they write it in a coded way. Uh, so as a public authority, maybe we should Shouldn't we try to adapt to their way of communication instead of trying to impose a thing that we are used to? Uh, so we need to look at upcoming generations. The, well, the, the, the working citizen, he probably wants to be uh, as efficient as possible, to, be, to have access wherever he, he, he is, uh, and not to have to bother about uh, technology, but just to be able to do the thing he needs to do. And then you have this still growing uh, proportion of uh, uh, society, which is the elderly, who struggle with technology, but who probably still want to be part of uh, society. And for them, we need to make our services in such a way that they are uh, uh, usable for them and understandable for them. So this makes me think that uh, whenever we build an infrastructure to make e-government, uh, and whenever we need to translate that into building blocks and interoperability and so on. Maybe we should keep all, all of that in mind uh, and uh, concentrate the way we communicate with them uh, in, in such a way that it is usable uh, for all these segments of population. Now, for us, we tried to uh, translate this in, uh, in the following way, that is, uh, what citizens see are nice websites uh, or maybe uh, websites that are made much nicer than uh, really what you are capable of doing. So we think it's uh, okay. It's good to make the website attractive, but uh, 
I think the most important thing is that in your back office, you're well organized so that in the front office site, you can uh, offer these services. In Belgium, we always say, back office, back office, back office. Start building a decent back office, organize it, secure it, before you start offering services on the front side. Because if you do the opposite way, you will get stuck uh, one, one or the other day. So we uh, concentrated on building our, our website. And as, uh, well, you know, Belgium is, a, is pretty complex politically. We have different regions and entities and so on. So we had to build one common back office system and still uh, allow the possibility uh, for these regions and municipalities and, and communities on the front of his site to build whatever services they wanted to. We, but we agreed to build uh, together uh, at least services where we put the citizen in the middle. And Paco already said it, citizen centricity is not just the word, is really implemented uh, uh, in Belgium. And we, we build a number of tools around him and for him so that he can function much better and we think that if we do that and we try to achieve that, then inevitably the uh, public sector will become more efficient also. First thing we had to do is to build this overall back office system uh, infrastructure. We have the municipalities that are all located in Brussels, they all have their independent infrastructure. We don't interfere into there, but we created the metropolitan area network to interconnect them in an efficient way. We created a federal service bus on top of that to organize the traffic from one to the other um, um, ministry uh, and we secured it at the same time. Uh, we created a security layer and with that actually you have uh, the full uh, back office system. We created on top of that the main entrance door or exit door let's say towards the outside world which is the national portal website. And then there was just one thing missing which was some kind of a secure key to get into that world. And for us, this is the national identity card. And the ID, the EID, is really a key to open a door and nothing more. Well, at least that's the strategy we took. So there's not much on the card. It's just the minimum information that I need to identify a citizen or call it a customer or whatever. I identify him in a strong way and I open the door. And of course, the consequence is that you go online to an application to do the rest. Uh, and that's the main philosophy uh, of, of the whole uh, interoperability back office system and the EID. So, uh, as I said, the electronic identity card plays a key role in the whole game. Uh, we think that whatever you do, whether you're physically in front of a civil servant or whether you're uh, behind uh, your PC on a website, you always start with identification. And we Belgian society said, well, we are best placed to uh, build that tool, to distribute it to our citizens uh, so that um, everybody can be identified. We have an identity card which is mandatory in Belgium as soon as you have the age of 12, but we created two variants, a kid's ID uh, for children under 12, which is uh, absolutely on a voluntary basis, and we have uh, also an identity card for foreign residents, uh, also that is mandatory. But these three all together, uh, actually you have all the Belgians or all those who are officially residing in Belgium. And they have a tool that we give them uh, that allows them to identify themselves and to function in society. Now, you have this back office system, you have this key to go into this world. Uh, now, let's talk about the applications. We in Belgium, we decided not to concentrate on applications, strangely enough. Uh, but more on concentrating on building tools and building blocks and developer kits so that those who want to build applications can do that in the best possible way. So the, the, the approach is a bit different. As a consequence, you see, ooh, I'm in trouble, you see a number of people uh, developing uh, applications all over. Now, again, this EID for me is uh, an EID that I can use as well in a physical world, for instance, in a municipality, uh, in the library, I have an, uh, an obvious way to access a library uh, in a swimming pool where I used to have to identify myself and show that I am an inhabitant of that municipality. Now I just insert my ID in a card reader and I can uh, enter uh, the thing. Same for container parks. Now I have a gate with a card reader where we used to have civil servants uh, checking identities. 
Uh, you go to a disco, you need to be 18. Uh, they will ask uh, to insert your ID in a card reader so they can check your date of birth. Uh, they will not take or store any data, they just use it as a tool to select. Uh, a nice one here is a, a vending machine where you can buy Coke or beer, but in case you want to buy the beer, you first need to insert also the identity card to prove that you're 18, and then only the beer drops out. Um, secondly, we build a number of tools. I need to go fast. Oh, God, <laughs> I'm in trouble. Uh, again, we build tools uh, so that uh, life becomes easier for either those who want to develop or those who want to use it. This I want to show. It's a, a screenshot of the Belgian portal website. There is a, a little uh, button that allows you to use it with your identity card. And while we make the link with your you as a citizen and the services there, I can just personalize the portal website and just bring your personal data and show them on the screen. I'm going to go faster than that because uh, I'm out of uh, uh, time. For municipalities, uh, who are actually the, the number one link with government, we built little pieces of uh, uh, code uh, that allows them to just copy and paste and insert it into their websites so that uh, they have an easy way to have a very well developed um, um, uh, website. Finally, just uh, as a conclusion, what are we building now? First of all, we are uh, developing much further identity and access management uh, in all its flavors. We try to make uh, whatever service we build uh, as hardware agnostic as possible because we think it's up to the citizen to decide which tool he wants to use to connect with government, which he feels much more comfortable with. It's, a, it's quite a challenge, this one. Uh, and then second, uh, finally, uh, we want to be as transparent and as open as possible. So here, Belgium, we, we need to do a bit more. Uh, we are behind on other countries. Uh, this is my last slide. You've seen this back office system. We're building this further so that regions and municipalities can also benefit from it. And uh, upwards, we interconnect with other countries. So, and I have no time, but uh, so that uh, we can just open the same uh, and extend it further to the whole of Europe. <laughs> Sorry about that, but uh, it's in a nutshell what we try to do. Thank you. I could present that one, but those are not my slides, so it, it might be <laughs> quite a challenge for me and for you as well. Perhaps we, we can put on the Austrian uh, slides, please. Uh, while that's happening, so that to streamline the questions at the end, uh, I'll give priority to anyone who tweets that yeah. question. Who do we address it to? Okay, uh, perfect. So these are, in principle, the topics I would like to, to run through. That's the uh, Austrian EID, which is called the Citizen Card Concept, and then the uh, newest innovation we, we have in Austria, the aspect, the aspect of interoperability, and then uh, I'd like to touch upon Stork and the future challenges, so let's see uh, how far uh, we get uh, within the 10 minutes. Uh, the citizen card, uh, we started with that uh, in the year of 2000 and we issued uh, from the beginning of 2003 the first citizen cards and we had uh, the e-government act uh, in uh, uh, the year 2004. So beginning from 2004 we have, uh, we have prepared um, an, an overall framework for e-government law uh, containing all the aspects on EID 
So the citizen card concept itself and all the issues which are connected to that, uh, uh, for instance, mandates for, uh, for legal persons and so on. So uh, I think uh, that was one of the major uh, um, uh, forerunners, so to say, in Europe concerning the legal uh, basis for e-government and e-ID. So what is the citizen card concept about? It's, uh, in comparison to Belgium, not uh, one single card or one specific medium, but it's a, it's a, it's a generic concept behind that, uh, which uh, is held by different media. So the, okay. the notion of card, citizen card, is not, not the best uh, word chosen for that in the year of 2004. Uh, it combines two elements mainly the one is a qualified electronic signature for declaration of intent authentication and the other one is the unique uh, electronic identity uh, for identification purposes and that goes with uh, specific data on representation and mandates uh, so the two uh, aspects we have here is one uh, the certification service provider on the one hand, which is in Austria, Atrust, uh, the, the service provider issuing qualified certificates, but it may be any other uh, certification service provider in, in, in accordance with the signature directive. Uh, and the other aspect is public uh, sector registries delivering the data for the unique identity, that is, the central register of residents in Austria and a so-called supplementary register which we need for all the people not living uh, in Austria. Uh, and those two aspects form the uh, so-called electronic identity. Uh, what are the citizen cards, so to say? On the one hand we have cards, physical cards, chip cards, uh, all the e-health insurance cards in Austria uh, can bear the element of citizen card. Uh, you can activate it free of charge in Austria, uh, but also, for instance, officials' cards like uh, my card that I'm, I'm, I'm identifying myself as uh, a collaborator for the Federal Chancellery that bears also the qualified signature and the element of identification and so on and so forth. And the next uh, element we introduced in 2009 is mobile phone signature, which is also issued free of charge. What is uh, the purpose of all that, I don't go into detail, I, we have more or less the, the uh, similar uh, applications and functions, uh, you heard about that, that signature, that's access within administration to e-government and uh, for e-commerce, e-business uh, purposes, and we as well have an open source program, uh, this is the address of the platform e-gov labs, and there you find all the open source uh, modules you would need to integrate that uh, electronic uh, ID or the citizen card function in the different applications. Uh, so we have card-based and mobile phone signature as the two ways of having citizen cards. For the card-based we have local, inst uh, uh, local software to be installed on the one hand and on the other hand a minimum fit footprint um, uh, software which comes uh, with your browser so you won't even have any uh, installation of software for your PC it runs uh, through an applet uh, in the browser uh, and the third uh, uh, way is the mobile phone so what is it this is the uh, the um, uh, innovation we have. Uh, I don't uh, have the possibility uh, to show you the logon itself. This is the main e-government portal we have in Austria. You would see here uh, the possibility to log in to your personali personalized offer. Uh, you click on handy, which is the Austrian uh, word for mobile phone, and then uh, you type in your mobile phone number and your uh, password, which you have chosen yourself uh, previously uh, and uh, then you receive on your mobile phone an SMS containing a one-time code, ephemeral code, uh, which is valid for five minutes. You type that in. You can have a, an additional look, of course, on your signature data behind that. There is a, is a, is a um, uh, specific data you can, you can, uh, you have displayed also on your mobile phone so you can compare for security reasons, and if you click on that, it's signed, and then you enter the application. That's it. 
So what is the mobile phone signature there for? It's a server-based citizen card function uh, solution uh, which produces electronic signatures which are qualified electronic signatures in, 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 in uh, accordance with the European uh, Signature Directive. Uh, we use familiar technology. Uh, everybody has in his hand uh, a mobile phone, so it's no uh, burden anymore. You won't have any software installation on your PC, uh, no uh, specific skills are required, no card reader is required. So uh, I, I simply go to, to, the, to the next internet cafe and use my citizen card function using my mobile phone. Uh, so uh, this is provided, as I said, uh, by the certification service provider. Uh, the signature creation data is kept with this uh, certification service provider in a hardware security module, securely stored, encrypted, and so on. So we have basically the two-factor authentication, uh, knowledge and possession, and the whole thing, the uh, hardware security uh, module, is uh, confirmed by a notified body in accordance with the requirements of the signature directive. So uh, in comparison with what we see, for instance, from Estonia, uh, we don't have any specific requirement on the phone itself because the signature creation data is not kept on the SIM card, on, on the pho phone itself. Uh, it is uh, uh, server-based, which means that you simply uh, uh, can use that by receiving an SMS, so and no requirement at all uh, on the uh, phone. So I skip some of those. Uh, so it's free of charge, I said that, platform independent and so on, that's quite clear. Uh, the registration possibilities is self-registration by uh, a qualified signature you already have in your hands, or you go to a registration authority, or you use other trusted systems like finance online or e-banking system to activate that. Uh, the interoperability issue, uh, that is an important f um, uh, issue I wanted to tackle about. Uh, we have integrated a framework in our e-government act for uh, recognition of foreign EID in the Austrian uh, system. So uh, we issued two years ago um, um, uh, a specific uh, legal, uh, legal regulation on that and we, uh, we uh, recognized 11 EIDs of other countries, of other member states, uh, as completely equal uh, as the Austrian citizen card. So uh, being in, in Estonia right now, we have included those two Estonian uh, EIDs in our system. So uh, basically, every, uh, everybody having in his hand such an Estonian ID can use uh, completely interoperable and completely recognized the Estonian EID. The Stork, uh, I only uh, show the outcome. We have uh, the, uh, different, um, the different demonstrators, the different pilots, uh, uh, is it me? Uh, uh, the different uh, pilots in place, uh, and the conclusion is it really works. We, we see that from the uh, different applications, uh, Paco told about uh, Circa BC and the ECOS. Uh, we have the Estonian e-government portal, we have uh, the delivery services of Austria and of Slovenia and so on and so forth. So, for instance, if I show you the, uh, the, uh, how I log in into the Austrian delivery service, uh, you click on the Stork, uh, uh, then you will see that one, you have a drop-down list for other member states, you choose Estonia and then it opens the Estonian website where you uh, simply uh, use your uh, Estonian EID and as soon as you finish that procedure, procedure you are logged in into the Austrian uh, uh, e-delivery service. So is the mission complete? Uh, well, we s we've seen uh, how we uh, can uh, solve the problems technically, but we have lots of uh, future uh, challenges uh, before us. We are right now um, uh, preparing for Stoke uh, 2.0 uh, where we are concentrating on uh, issues like non-natural persons and the question of mandates and representations between them. 
Uh, the issue of mobility is a very crucial issue for all that, with all the convenience uh, simplicity things. And the last uh, word, which uh, draws a, a bit uh, um, a hint to the, to the afternoon session, cloud computing and EID may be a quite thrilling and uh, uh, exciting experience. So complexity re re reduction is at stake. We need to simplify the legal framework and the usage of all that. This is it in a nutshell. Thanks. Is mine? Yes. Uh, the last. I you want to be last because you're the most the, exciting. The European <laughs> people first. <laughs> be, because I, I am not in the European co uh, community and there's anything I have another point of view. Okay. So I'm representing Data Exchange Agency of Georgia. Uh, so our agency was created last year in January and we are responsible on e-government development, um, uh, the creation of data exchange infrastructures. This is like how we are implementing interoperability in, in our country and elaboration, information security and policy. So generally from 2003, Georgian government starting very active and aggressive reforms in public sector. And um, main purpose of reforms is like efficiency uh, to save time, money, so and so make uh, much more easy, uh, make availability for consumers, for citizens, for business, and etc. etc. And also transparency in the accountability. And um, do uh, all of us uh, agreed? So uh, information technology is best solution for this. Uh, to resolve all these problems and uh, simplify any business process or make it in transparency or cost efficiency and etc. Cetera, et cetera. So during the uh, last two years, here is like project which is implemented by Georgian government. So here is, uh, I think, from my point of view, it's a really, a really big number. So we have like um, e-treasury, um, e-filing system, e-procurement, e-auction for uh, governmental goods. Um, uh, in schools, we are just uh, delivering um, notebooks for um, beginners, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, generally, during implementation of this project, all governmental agencies have problem. We have like limit budget. We have like um, uh, no uh, limited resources of uh, IT specialists, uh, and so all these problems are known for every public sector, and so it's very uh, understandable. And um, in first time, when we're developing this information system internally, it was main purpose to serve business needs of any public organization. Let's say for civil registry, it was very critical to organize, automate internal business process. Same was for Ministry of Finance, same was for public restaurants, etc., etc. But after this, when we, uh, um, we uh, already developed these information systems, it's become necessary to starting exchange information between information systems, like currently, when when you are registering um, uh, property, it's need uh, in, um, okay just public registries required information from civil registry or Ministry of Finance regarding tax liability and etc. etc. And also we are delivering services to business sector. Let's say when um, uh, when citizen is take loan uh, and he is like try to uh, start um, get hypothek uh, credit. Uh, so this means we have to get information from public sector, public service. Also we need some kind of uh, some information from. Uh, civil service, uh, civil um, mm, mm, registry, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is how it's looked today. Our uh, current infrastructure. So this means in every information system, we are developing special module. It's connected to other information systems throughout VPN, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And consumers of uh, each um, uh, information system is growing. And to keep uh, this kind of system uh, alive, it's very difficult. It's not cost effective. And uh, here it's like compromise different issues like security. Uh, also, it's very difficult to um, uh, monitor who is and uh, why accessing uh, personal information, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what our agencies try to implement? This is like main principles. Um, 
what we would like implement. So one stop shop silence is, uh, consists um, uh, and to e easier um, delivery for services for citizens. And we, from uh, beginning of this year, we starting implementation of data exchange infrastructure. So data exchange infrastructure is look like this. This is concept. Uh, all agencies will be public, uh, publishing where services to our our agency's infrastructure. And throughout these services, um, uh, throughout our uh, data exchange infrastructure, it will be possible. Uh, to access any governmental information, any, uh, any information which is exists in public sector. Also, we will allow to using this information, to, uh, uh, this infrastructure to business sector. So let's say this is this example. So business um, will deliver request to our agency. Our agency will be analyze this request. Uh, this request can contain like different um, uh, uh, requests. Uh, maybe will requ require from different agencies information. So this uh, request will be delivered to appropriate ministries where it will be just delivered back response and so we are merging this response and deliver it back to business. So this is general main concept of what we like. So this is like high level architecture design of this our system. We have like core system, governmental gateway it's called. Uh, to access, uh, also this system will be have like presentation layer. Through presentation layer, it can be, it will be accessible services uh, from cit uh, for citizens, businesses, governmental employees. Also, it can be like direct access. We have direct access from information systems. Like uh, you can create application and integrate services which is exist and uh, published on our governmental gateway in your uh, information system. In currently, you know, it's impossible to have like. Um, um, uh, we have in our in country like one tax system, okay, e-filing system, because like Ministry of Finance is a natural monopoly for this. But when uh, this kind of infrastructure will be exist, so it means business can also create like different applications and they can prop propose to citizens like different um, e-filing systems or, um, yeah, it's, it's, it will be very good for government and also for business. <laughs> Uh, this is like um, detailed um, functional view, so we have like uh, presentation layer, it's like absolutely so uh, in um, architecture and um, I think I not will spend your, your time <laughs> to discuss these things. So how, what we would like um, to have like e-governments, what is our vision, so all uh, like um, all governmental structure will be interconnected throughout data exchange. And so it will be help like uh, uh, it will be help us to proper planning of state budget. Let's say we have like a lot of pensioners, lot of refugees. So it will be like accumulate this data in one place and during budget planning also. Uh, yeah, we will be uh, improve uh, duplic uh, duplicates in different places. So we will be have like uh, uh, we will be uh, we will be um, uh, like uh, know which register contain like primary data. It's and so all all others register will be take direct this data uh, for their purpose. Um, what we are planning to build up to uh, of this infrastructure. So this is first of all this joint uh, document exchange. Um, um, System so any public organization will be starting exchange information between each other throughout this infrastructure. Also, uh, we, we will create special electronic um, um, uh, message delivery system to uh, citizen, uh, which will be have like um, legal. Um, uh, uh, aspects. Uh, we will create citizen portal. So th in this portal, we will integrate. Uh, in late uh, next slide, we will sh I will show uh, this concept and trade net. This is trade net uh, where we will be. Uh, we will concentrate on trade oriented um, uh, uh, organizations. We will integrate all organizations like custom. Uh, um, uh, tax, uh, seaport, railway, forwarder companies, and etc. And so all of them will be integrated in one logical system and throughout one stop shop. This is uh, traders can um, uh, 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 arrange all uh, business processes uh, uh, throughout this system. Uh, so this is like a citizen portal, how we uh, are, uh, think uh, it will be look like. So all, all information and all services related to citizen will be, um, uh, uh, will be uh, delivered throughout one um, uh, citizen portal. And um, um, 
uh, and also citizens will be uh, allowed to see who and uh, when uh, request information about uh, this person. This will be increased uh, transparency and accountability, and so citizens will be have also access. Uh, citizens will be have much more control when even uh, we here today. So of course we just pick a lot of time to whole day. So it's also very important security. Our agency is also responsible on information security. Uh, we are. Uh, uh, working, um, uh, we are responsible on public sector and critical infrastructure, and we not <coughs> we not responsible on defense in secret information. In general, what we are doing in uh, information security is like uh, we are responsible to develop policy, Im implement, and also in sometimes to doing audit in uh, public sector and critical infrastructure. And also under our agencies exist. Uh, uh, Ser Georgia, and we are doing penetration of information systems, um, yeah, network monitoring, um, and also in every aspects we are doing a lot of uh, public awareness campaigns. It's because our agency is um, new, and especially CERT was starting in this year, we are just initiating these projects. So EID, um, uh, so here is like um, you know, how long we uh, was um, uh, start uh, developing this uh, process. So in 2006 was first draft of this law, 2007 uh, law was adopted, 2008 we have like uh, uh, technical recommend, re uh, recommendation. After this government's um, plan was to not um, uh, to, to allow business to just introduce uh, e-signature and uh, e-signature, but unfortunately Georgian business and also we have like few tenders, but unfortunately you know business uh, not was ready. I don't know. We, we not see like market value for this project in, for Georgia, maybe because we are small country and penetration of your internet is not very high. And uh, in this year public registry, uh, civil registry Registry was started implementation of this EID, and um, um, in August already we have like EID and this signature um, inside. So this is like how it's looked. So already one year we are just distributing this um, EID, and uh, our EID have like uh, two interfaces, like contactless and um, um, uh, contact. Uh, it's have like one uh, one chip. Uh, so contactless interfaces um, uh, will be used for um, small payments. It's like it's like like interface for businesses. So we can just uh, certify their application, and uh, civil registry will help them to uh, put um, uh, a proper certified applications. And is this uh, will be used for let's say banks, uh, small uh, small businesses, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's uh, already uh, business have like big big interest to uh, put uh, their own applications here. And of course, uh, contact, uh, contact infer interface. So it's contain um, two certificates uh, for um, uh, authentication and for a digital signature. And uh, so, so online authentication, we speak already a lot of time, so it can happen from any place. And also a signature. So, so what's uh, social effect we will have? Like uh, transactional costs will be uh, decrease, environmental cost, corruption, because its interaction bet uh, between like citizen and um, public administration will be uh, decreased. Number of interactions, and so we will be increased productivity, citizen uh, satisfaction, and competitiveness. So, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> we are, there, there is one saving grace in, in, in our slight overrunning with, with all of this content, in that much of it overlaps with the cloud tutorial session this afternoon. So if you have a burning question you don't get to ask about EID or interoperability, you can bring it to that and confront many of the same people and have your say. So, are we staying in Europe? We're staying in Europe. We're staying in Estonia. And um, not with Margaret as advertised, but you will have to introduce yourself, because you are not. Yes, and uh, so I don't have my bio at the book, then I was asked to do a short presentation, who am I? So basically, yes, I've been, I'm working in the same department as, as Markus uh, Bia, and been involved with EIT project in Estonia in various different ways. First, at the very early deployment phase when the cards were, cards were basically issued and then I've been seeing it as 
have been creating the services while being in a private company meanwhile and then coming back to the government and being a government advisor about how it all should fit together. Uh, so out of the 10 years, nine years, nine and a half years of experimenting with uh, Estonian identity card and EID, I've not been asked to do a 10 minute conclusion of uh, what we've learned. Uh, so it's, um, and, and I'm sometimes very critical person, so I will also focus a lot on what, uh, what, what hasn't been working out or what, what the issues, issues are and what the issues are still, even if we consider how it all fits to the European Union context. Uh, so first of all, listening to these presentations and then listening to the interoperability and the services and how EID shall and is used. I would say that, um, that we are having a lot of very good uh, overviews about what the infrastructures in different countries look like now. And it is all very nice and uh, very nice and, 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 and neat. While at the same time, if we look at the interoperability in the European Union wide, and if we look at the digital single market, and if we look what it all is about, then we should say, or at least it's becoming more and more obvious that this electronic identity is some, somewhat a bandage to remedy many things which are becoming more and more obstacle inside the European Union, because um, if we talk about digital single market, then it is basically a very obvious concept that if somebody wants to do business in Europe, he should do business in Europe rather than doing business on in individual countries. And if you look at the United States, they pretty much solved it. There are many states, but still the same country. Uh, pretty much it's homogeneous around, around different states. We don't have that benefit. So if somebody wants to do business in Europe, he has to figure out where he wants to do it. And then basically everything else will be the hassle to figure out how it works in a particular country. It's not too different, but it's annoyingly different still. And the EIDs and, and everything what you've seen so far here is, I think, absolutely inevitable part of making it happen because it's, it's the, the true interoperability is not that if we can connect to, uh, to uh, if you can connect to IT systems, well, we can send email to each other if nothing else works, but, but, but technic, uh, technicalities are all doable. It's, the technics is almighty, it can do anything. The question is in processes. And, and, and sometimes what we've learned is that those processes are coming very deep down to the how member states behave, because, uh, for example, uh, we have issued electronic ID for a long, long time, and we've been trying to promote it pretty much to anybody who have been able to listen, uh, both for the economical reasons that if we can sell the same concept to somebody else, there are less standardization, what has to be happened later to make it all compatible, up to the point when we s feel that being a small country would have benefit of if you get your technology in, the world becomes a little bit wider for you and a little bit m less expensive to, um, uh, to, to work at. And so we found all kinds of strange and interesting, uh, interesting findings during that process. For example, the one thing is that we are talking about single electronic identity and we are talking about accepting each other's identities. And that is all very, very nice concept, except that then at some point you will figure out that Although we all talk about the same things, there is not really a framework how the single identity should be implemented in a policy way. And so what we end up is with is that, uh, for example, in Estonian case, you have your three ministers fighting to each other, telling who should be responsible of assuring that the particular uh, PK infrastructure is valid, that the keys are valid, and the companies running it are not phonies, but they are real companies and not trying to... I don't know, hijack Estonia with the false identities coming from the Belgium. And then you have these negotiations. It, and, 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 and everybody's agreeing that, that, that the system is in place and it should work and that, that we trust that the Belgium and Austria and, and whoever else have made a good representation with their EIDs. Uh, but, but still, you have this little layer of legality when, or, or legal issues when uh, when, when all of a sudden people start to think, is it my job, is it their job? 
is there any money involved that they can get for doing that job? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I can get some of that money and say that I will do that. So, uh, so, so these issues are something what, uh, what, what we are all facing now, and these are, uh, these are not uh, easy things to counter, because um, we now have, uh, if you enter to the Estonian uh, Companies Registry, then on the front page you will be able to use four foreign identities at the moment. I'm not even sure why Austria is not in th that list, but the Belgium, Portugal, uh, Finland and Lithuania are there with their identities. And, uh, and technically it's all solved and we've been somehow agreeing also that how, we, how the process of acceptance works. But for example, adding more countries there is a little bit difficult sometimes because uh, let's say that somebody will deploy the electronic identity there are no guidelines for deploying electronic identity. The only guideline is that you likely should do a public tender. And you are very, n none of the countries are in a position to very tightly specify who should win the public tender and with what technology. So it basically means that there is an open season in the, uh, everywhere the electronic identity will be deployed. And yes, whatever you do, you will at the end of the day be able to connect back offices with each other. But the question is that how much work that takes is not specified. We, we don't have a single, still in a, in a country, we don't have a single uh, decision what application, if any additional to the signature and authentication can be on the card. I, I like Georgian approach very much with uh, putting a RFID part on it because uh, what we found here is that uh, if you want to have a services deployed, then you have to do it simple. You have to make people a simple things to do with the card so that they will get used to the idea that they have a card. And then you can move on to the more complex things and, and adding all digital signatures and all kind of complicated processes behind it. But it starts from the simple thing. I, I, maybe, maybe as simple as a door access. On Estonian case, it was a public transportation, which was really the first... Um, which was really the first application becoming mm -hmm. very popular because municipality <coughs> was, um, was starting to use. And, and this was the moment when people started to feel that this real physical card is somewhat useful. Of course, there was complicated digital uses as before. Everybody were trying to sign into their tax board with that before and, and, and making their tax declaration, but this wasn't as effective because uh, you still had other means of entering, so this small step from going from the bank identity cards to the national identity card, this little step was somewhat difficult to, uh, somewhat difficult to make. So there are such issues that are very closely tied with an interoperability and, 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 and being able to treat Estonia, the Europe as a single market from Estonian perspective. But it's a lot of work and negotiations unifying it, and it probably will not even happen in, uh, in a one pass. It will probably be an iterative process, and we we'll probably have to revisit the whole idea of, of having this single identification space several years on, because uh, <coughs> as, as different um, countries have started implementing it a little bit differently, there will probably be some point when the common sense and common ground will be developed that says that, okay, this is probably what it should more or less look like at the end of the day. And, and we are still very far away from that because it, if you looked at the slides earlier, then uh, not, not many countries today have deployed anything which is both legally and technically sound. There's a lot of uh, different initiatives, there's a lot of different ideas, but only very few countries have it solidly implemented that the legislative uh, means can be said that the uh, signature given with the national PKA infrastructure is exactly the same uh, legal grounds as your physical signature or, or your identity can be checked with that infrastructure 100% certainty, with 100% certainty as much as, as you would be physically there. So this much about the view that what we, what we see, what is going to happen, happen next. I still have a minute and a half probably left, so I'll give so a couple of the uh, slides there as well about um, what we've been doing and, and, and um, 
And if you look at this picture, no Estonian can do any presentation for the e-government without showing this totally obscure slide to everybody. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but the idea is that if you look at why there is no way of doing anything like that, uh, like e-government without electronic ID in place, then this is this picture. You have to have this some sort of middleware what runs it all. You have to make this middleware secure somehow. So you obviously have to have the PK infrastructure. So un unless somebody invents, uh, invents something more clever for that. And now all these different institutions providing data to that infrastructure, on Estonian case, we don't access the data directly, but we have the views to the data from the different databases, and then it is all composed here and given as a data set from all that rather than the particular records. You will end up with absolutely unevitable need for public servant authentication because otherwise the system will be abused sooner or later. Now, if you let the citizen in there, you have absolutely no way of doing it without authenticating the citizen. But if you've given full government data to him, it better be something better than, uh, than password and the username because that's, that's, that's going to be very difficult to implement state-wise for all the systems for the, just the security reasons by itself. So you have to go, and now this layer has somehow to connect all the member states at some point. And this is not going to happen without having an EID in place. So with a lot of inventions, what we still have to do in order to make it homogeneous and make it work, and, and, and all the initiatives what we have in place uh, throughout Europe, I think they are very, very good, especially Stalk, which has taken it both on the technical side and on the, uh, on the, uh, on the corporate side of how it, how it fits together. So I think that's as much as I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> and Pedro, we're moving down south a long way. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, your Spanish is better than my English. Sure. <coughs> I try to speak in English. I prepare one speech. But first, I want to talk about uh, two or three th things. First, uh, I am very agree to to listen from the people of uh, the community, the Europe, uh, Europe community, uh, because our problems uh, is the same. We have uh, the idea like Paco, we don't have any techni technical problems. It's a legal problems, it's cultural problems, and it's for the framework to give this service. Uh, but the solution in, EU, in Europe not is the same in Argentina or Latin America because we have an, another problem. We have, uh, I don't know in Europe, but in Argentina we have the problem to, uh, from the social inclusion. Not everybody have uh, computer laptops, uh, iPads like us uh, because if not uh, make the social inclusion a reality, we don't can make a digital inclusion. Uh, our problem is, is this, the people need the computer to can access to the e-government. And uh, this is our, our work to can't uh, push these people to the e-government. I prepare a, a few words, uh, sorry, I try to, I, I need to, to read it, and if anybody won't stop me to make a question, no problem. The second, please. E-government is not the same as years ago, but the road to, to success is, the, is that citizens can really use it, and for that we must give security for these transactions. It's very hard, my, uh, my presentation, but... <laughs> Next. Okay. Everybody knows this. This is the, uh, govern, uh, the IT governance. We know it, uh, we can implement it in Argentina. We, uh, we make a hard work in the last uh, two years, but uh, this is not the problem. E-government, uh, 
While the system of governance and technology standards are the same for all, solutions are not the same to implement in each country. The, I, I write this uh, two days ago, maybe, but uh, all the speakers, maybe the, the idea is the same. Everyone, everybody have one solution for each country. Uh, maybe the work is in the interoperability and the standards to can communicate between us, but uh, don't have one silver bullet, one uh, stronger idea for all the people. It's not the same solution for a company that for government. It's not the same for a project in Estonia than in the United States, Japan or Argentina. Each country has its law and customs, but what? Uh, but what is the same is the goal, having a reliable e-government. Argentina has 40 million citizens, and the digital inclusion should be eliminating the digital gap. But the challenge was how to provide tools without giving security to that identity. All the people in three years, one year ago and two years more, uh, in uh, the, the, peoples, the, the people in the school year have your netbook because a lot of people can't, uh, the, the parents can't buy it, but the government give, a, give to these people the, uh, the netbook to can access. Let's consider that the project Connectar Igualdad aims to digital integrate more than three million students in only eight months more than one million networks were, were delivered to students, reaching more than 4,100 schools nationwide. Considering also that we carried out, out, out the uh, Argentina Connected program, which in a month will provide e free internet access to more than three million people in the first instance and in three years to entire population. We are making uh, technical hard work, but we maybe have one problem if we don't ensure, we don't uh, make a stronger security identity to can access to the government information. We are the keeper, we are the keeper of the information about the citizens. We are not the owner, and we need uh, be stronger and secure of these transactions. We have, we have created a critical infrastructure protection and cyber security information program, reinforcing the action that we were developing, extended powers in the digital infrastructure protections, and also fortify and update the digital signature structure for all the procedures. We have a law. This is a law for the people from Estonia I talk about this. For, for us, the digital uh, signature is valid if you uh, can make uh, some specific uh, uh, scenarios. Uh, process and procedures is very strongest. But, <laughs> however, the data and, and identity theft continues working. As you can see, these are, uh, uh, these are just some of the facts in 2011. Uh, everybody knows the, these numbers and these companies and the, the stolen of this data. data. In Argentina, by law, citizens are registered from birth. As you know, human beings are born with biometric data. The, then parents assign a name and the state a number. But in the digital world, one chooses use usernames, password, digital signatures, and even federation, thus creating a cyber identity. That is why we must think to reinforce or mechanism for digital identity with a triple factor. Something that I am, something I have, and something I know is our way. No, it's your way maybe, but our way, yes. We have a law to can register, uh, register uh, biometric data and use it in favor of the citizens. Of course, the preservation of this data must meet the minimum requirements to ensure citizens' privacy, being more than necessary to, align, to alliance between government, association, and business to create a trusted identities ecosystem. 
Referring to consolidate biometrics for digital identity, we plan to use interoperability based on the ANSI-NIS standard. This is all our uh, the biometric database, only in Argentina. Uh, we have a very hard work in the last 10 years to, to make uh, the duplication and, one, uh, and only one database for all biometric information from the citizen. It's a first line to, into the world against the um, identity stolen. We must consider that within, inter, uh, it, with it, within interoperable, interoperable biometric information in Latin America, there are more than 380 million records. And as you can see, six countries, countries concentrate 88% of the total records. The Ibero-American framework was adopted for the social electronic identification, incorporating biometrics as identification tools. Everything to preserve the citizen identity in every way and in all their dealings with the government. Considering every point, we are working to make the Internet a safer place for everyone. Uh, the idea is someone in, in Argentina can uh, take a PKA, a digital signature, from a company or from another country or uh, with, um, I don't know the name, if the, will it, the paper, when you, cuando haces un DNA trucho. Fake idea, thank you. Uh, we are uh, making two years ago the new identification system in Argentina, and now we are working in the electronic uh, identification, electronic passport. Uh, but we have a lot of years ago uh, f five or six documents, and we can't uh, say if the, this document is real or not. We prefer use the, uh, use the biometric to check uh, if you are you and not only invoke or tr uh, trying to, to make your identity and try to access your data. Uh, this is the idea. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We have 10 minutes left for questions, because I promised to finish in time for lunch. If the panelists could move that way. They've been sitting there so they could see each other's presentations, not so that they would just have their backs to you. We have... Uh, Stephen was actually first with the question, but Gideon relates more obviously and follows very nicely to what we've just seen. So if we... Would you like to ask it yourself, or would you like me to paraphrase you? Okay, uh, question, what are the biggest risks do you see for identity theft and how have you dealt with them? Well, um, <laughs> this is not uh, an easy question to, to, to reply, I mean there are uh, we have seen the the, the, the situation <laughs> out there. I mean, uh, uh, Pedro uh, <laughs> displayed the, the, the slide. So I mean, if you apply uh, the, the rules and uh, you tight uh, security, you are decreasing your uh, your uh, likelihood to be to be attacked. But uh, the, the biggest risk, in my opinion, is internal. I mean. <laughs> Internal. <laughs> there are plenty of situations. Uh, we were speaking to to to, to Peter before, and I was uh, out there uh, advertise uh, this uh, kind of hugging of uh, one of the systems in Austria. And as a matter of fact, it looks like it uh, was uh, somebody who delivered the data. Uh, we in our institutions, uh, we have a problem with leaks. And so <laughs> it's uh, it's, uh, it's not nothing to do with electronics. It's, uh, the weakest uh, point is a human. You can apply all the rules uh, you want. If somebody fails uh, 
uh, to into the change to comply with the, with the rules. You have to put as many controls as people uh, is is a very tough. So zero risk does not exist. What you have to apply is a reasonable security. You have to create awareness, and uh, you have to have a good audit and monitoring capabilities that are going to give you the 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 the, uh, the track to possible uh, kind of uh, fake identity or or leaks. Perhaps somebody else wanted to ask something. Well, for me, I think uh, you, you can always try to be ahead of uh, those who want to do identity theft. I think, let's face it, identity theft will happen yeah, in, in some or another f form. I think the biggest risk is uh, how public sector does uh, uh, damage management um, and how they handle the crisis when it happens. Um, I think it's, it's nothing that is as worse as uh, having uh, losing the trust of your citizens because of that. So uh, um, it's all the way how we will manage it and recover it and, and, and get this, this trust again uh, at, the, at the level that we need to have it. That's for me the, the biggest threat. Yes, uh, with now issuing identity cards for pretty much everybody in the country, I think it is time to make a difference between identity theft and somebody else doing transactions on your behalf. And the question is that most of the things what we refer to as identity theft is actually when somebody is doing transactions on your behalf and you don't know that. So for example, in Estonian case, what we've done is that uh, we've been trying to make everything you do with your digital identity as transparent to the identity owner as possible so that uh, that this identity theft moment wouldn't happen that the physical crime of somebody else doing transactions without your consent would be as early stage on possible to discover as possible and it is also somehow not doesn't make sense to do it all by the government in a sense that we are not able to deploy 100 public servants to monitor if, if everybody's behavior patterns look the same today as they were yesterday. So we've been delegating it more or less to the citizen in a way that they can do this by themselves in their portal. And, and, and now the question is that we just should work on the awareness that people would actually do check what has been done with their identity. I mean, just to follow up on that, is there a significance in, do you think, in how many factors of identity, are, uh, of identity verification are used in Argentina? Sorry. Sorry, I was just asking if there is any significance in the different levels of identity auth authentication. In Argentina, you use triple factor. Uh, in other countries, it seems only two factors. Do, do you think that makes a big, a big difference? <laughs> the more barriers uh, you put, uh, the better. But uh, at the same time, uh, the best uh, <laughs> possible way of uh, defeating, I mean, of, of uh, bypassing uh, uh, kind of security is uh, imposing too many things, uh, so you have to 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 find the right balance. Uh, I, I believe that uh, two-factor authentication is already something that is a uh, reasonable, uh, good, and the way you implement it uh, uh, is is uh, meaningful. I mean, implementing that uh, with uh, with something that uh, that uh, you like like the GSM that uh, you are going to the cell phone that you are going to take with you. For me, it's uh, much better than giving the the, um, the citizen or the user very many <laughs> kind of uh, devices that they had to remind the password and, and so on and so forth. That's uh, I believe that uh, we need to to find the right balance in order to uh, lower the risks. Well, in any case, uh, user ID and password as as only one factor, so to say, is is what uh, should not really be recommended anymore for for any. Uh, 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 application and system, so we we um, uh, we really count on the two-factor authentication system we have in in place in Austria. Uh, of course, uh, what what Paco said before, the human factor as risk uh, uh, element is is what what counts uh, in the back office. Is one element which which we tried. Uh, to solve as well, and I, I did not go into detail here in the presentation because it, it then would take another uh, 10 minutes or so, is um, we tried to separate the identifiers uh, for data protection reasons uh, which are used for the, for the persons 
in the different fields of application of the, of the governments. So we don't have uh, one unique identifier in place in Austria which you use in all different uh, uh, sectors of, of uh, businesses and of government. Uh, but it's only the user who has in his hands with the citizen card concept the identifier and we, uh, we uh, make uh, one-way hash functions uh, for deriving sector-specific identifiers which are used then in the different applications. So my identifier which is used uh, for finance applications and my uh, identifier which is used for, let's say, e-health applications is completely different and they can't be uh, related to each other and there is no way of transforming that without my, uh, uh, my active involvement with my citizen card function. So this is one uh, element we, which we introduced in Austria to separate uh, those things and minimize data protection risks. Perhaps I can add something that uh, because uh, we, we had uh, some kind of, uh, of, of security incident uh, and we implemented uh, for external access uh, apart from the token uh, access that we had uh, before for uh, two-factor authentication. So what we are doing now is uh, going back uh, from one password for everything to three passwords. One for the internet access in order to avoid traffic uh, outbound, one uh, for uh, from, from inside our network, one uh, for uh, for uh, the the um, accessing the workstations uh, for employees, and one uh, for accessing the the application. Well, <laughs> I have to say that it's a tough time for the users, but uh, we consider it absolutely essential. Of course, uh, we are advising the user that uh, at the end of the day, having uh, three kind of uh, password can be easily solved if uh, you properly put uh, a couple of characters uh, in a random way, uh, given the same mnemotetics. But uh, from from a kind of security point of view, it's, uh, it's uh, quite uh, safe. And um, I, I foresee for the future that uh, things are going to be more complicated. And I, I do agree with uh, what uh, Frank said. We need to prepare for the worst. I mean, we need uh, to enhance uh, the response capabilities and because uh, Incidents, uh, the probability for incidents uh, are higher than 0%. So <laughs> they are not 100%, but uh, certainly uh, it's uh, not nil. <laughs> and don't forget, in, in Latin America, the people, uh, it's common to obtain the identity document, put your fingers and the facial records. Uh, for us, it's usually. In, in other countries, not. For us, is uh, the triple factor is for the fourth. Is default for us, okay? And uh, in Argentina, especially, the identity is only one. All the uh, the um, uh, I don't know the name, the the taxes, the driver list, the license, and the location, and all the the uh, the other the data is attributes f from this identity. I I have one only one identity in my country, and this if I have uh, or I wanna. Uh, electronic ID, it's uh, over this identity, not to the second or third identity. Thank you. Now, the, uh, we did have another question. It was about interoperability. It was going to be very interesting, but it, but it is on Twitter. So I'd like to take things a step further and suggest that Francisco and the others reply via Twitter to Stephen's excellent question. Uh, it's probably going to be, actually, from it's a very much EC-oriented question, but uh, OK. Uh, well, I'd like to thank all of the speakers uh, and for their, the amount of insight that you've managed to cram into 10 minutes. And I'm sorry for sitting there staring at you at the wrong moments. Uh, hopefully, those who are interested, I imagine all of this data is openly available. and. Um, People can find your slides and they can find out more about the way you do things. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.